Aloha. Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and today's title is The Election Strategy is in Full Swing. Uh, you know, when we only have about 29 days left in the election, you would think that a candidate that is neck and neck with its opponent is trying to appeal to those voters that are sitting on the fence. They haven't quite made up their mind. And a lot of those voters may be uh, moderate Republicans and or uh, independents. And you would think that your appeal would go in that direction to try to attract those, those undecided voters to your side. But that's not the case with Donald Trump. What Donald Trump is doing is ex it appears to be taking some extreme positions to either appeal to his MAGA base or to some unknown uh, voter group that we haven't identified yet. And uh, we'll talk about some of those strategies that Donald Trump and his campaign has chosen uh, here in this program. And with me in this program is our special esteemed guest, David Hall, former practicing attorney for many, many years here in Honolulu. And of course, my co-host, Jay Fidel. Gentlemen, good morning. Hi, Jay. Uh, Jay, first question to you. We've watched now a couple of weeks where the campaign seems to be taking a very diverse direction, certainly since the debate with uh, Vice President Harris. Is this the planned campaign strategy? Or do you think that Donald Trump has once again, as in the past, has diverted from the good advice that he may be receiving from his advisors? I think, you know, the essential strategy for Donald Trump is to get into the headlines. The essential strategy is to find a way to get attention. It seems like it's always been that way. It was that way when he was doing his strange manipulation of the media back when he was in real estate. And it has been that way since, you know, he's been in office and and uh, he doesn't like to see Kamala Harris get attention. He likes to... Um, you know, get on top, and and that's what he's been doing. So he's be he's become unpredictable. And why is he unpredictable? Why is he doing strange things like appearing in Madison Square Garden, which is actually not a, a Republican venue at all? Um, it's to get attention. It's to, it's to have people say, "What is he doing now?" It's to entertain, like a reality show, like The Apprentice. Um, that way, he steals the oxygen, he steals the headlines, and he gets attention, not necessarily in Madison Square Garden, although that's a possibility, but among his base. So you have lots of news that is being generated. When he talks about cats and dogs and, and how Biden is responsible for bad weather and all this, I mean, he's really making outrageous statements to get attention. So whatever we discuss today, whatever we find as elements of his new th three and a half week uh, strategies, it's it, the core point is that. That's my view. Well, let me tag on to that for a second, Jay. And, and I agree, he's always looking for attention and that's just the way of a narcissist, an extreme narcissist. Um, but let me suggest maybe that, um, and I don't know if this is just comes natural to Donald Trump or it's a planned strategy. And that is he's trying to exploit fear. Uh, look at the the Butler, um, the Butler, Pennsylvania rally stop to um, celebrate the anniversary of his uh, being um, an attempted assassination. Um, Donald Trump and Vance implied that it's the Democrats trying to take him out. And then, of course, Eric Trump explicitly stated it. Uh, no two ways about it. And then uh, Laura Trump also uh, implied it and said this is a race between good and evil. And of course, the Democrats, by implication, is they're evil. Uh, so again, trying to really stir up uh, the conspiracy that Democrats were behind two attempted uh, attempts on his life. And I, I think that's exploiting fear. Let's look at what he did in in um, Springfield, Ohio, again, exploiting fear that uh, the immigrants, one, are not, they're not legally uh, allowed there because they're undocumented, which isn't true, um, that they're taking the jobs of those, uh, not true. And of course, the ever famous, they're eating the dogs, they're eating the cats, they're eating the pets of the people that live there. Not true, uh, but exploiting fear. And then, of course, uh, the, the government's uh, response to uh, Hurricane Helena and certainly with Milton on, on its doorstep. 
uh, that FEMA is taking great, great sums of money out of the account for FEMA and awarding it to undocumented immigrants or certainly um, not attending or showing up uh, to those regions that are GOP laden, that are residents of the GOP party, that they're being ignored. Again, uh, stroking fear. Um, Jay, is that a winning strategy? Well, first, I want to say it, it's consistent. It's consistent with uh, getting attention. I, I think that he he does these outrageous things, uh, makes outrageous conspiracy statements and insults because he wants people to notice him. It, as you said, it's the narcissistic way. I mean, the people in the last picture show in in some small town in Texas who sit around all day and listen to Sinclair radio, that's the news for them. And that's entertainment for them. And they don't care if it's true or not. It's worth talking about. It's like a, one guy turns to the other guy in the barbershop and he says, did you hear what he said? Did you hear it? You know, and, and that's entertainment. It's excitement. It's taking all the oxygen out. And so it, it, uh, it consolidates his base. It gives entertainment. And it doesn't matter to 50 million people, maybe 60, um, that it's not true. So is, is it working? Well, it's working with them. Uh, it's not working with, um, you know, Democratic voters. I, I don't think he's going to achieve anything in, in Madison Square Garden, but who knows? Maybe there are some among them that can be weaned over on the basis of reality show uh, kinds of outrageous statements. Um, but I, I, the, my first reaction, I'd be interested in Dave's reaction on this. My first reaction is this is really a waste of time. He's not playing to the people in New York. He's playing to his base. He's, he's showing his base that he can go into the big Democratic blue states and, and draw some kind of crowd. Um, that's that's really all it is. I, I think he must be desperate. There's a well, certain desperation going on in his strategy right now. OK, so maybe he has pull information that we don't know about um, and it's not good for him. Uh, David, to you. Um, Two part question here. One is, what is your overall opinion on on the Trump strategy? That's number one. But number two is, is is he playing for, to a two tier market? Which is to say, um, if you're neck and neck in the poll numbers, uh, it seems to me he's self destructing with this approach that he's been taking in the last couple of weeks, uh, and, and that's not going to get him over the top over Harris. So is he is he playing to an audience to either motivate those that would not normally not vote his base? Um, that they they believe in what he says, everything he says, but they just don't get out of the chair and vote? Or is he playing to a, 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 an audience that he's preparing them for a loss and to act badly after the election loss? Uh, what are your general thoughts, David, on, the, on this, uh, these questions? It seems that ever since uh, Kamala entered the, uh, the race, uh, he really hasn't had a strategy. I think it did really throw him. Uh, when she came in and he didn't know how to handle her and still doesn't know how to handle her. And therefore, he he makes the outrageous statements, as Jay said, just to, you know, get uh, an audience and get play in the press. But uh, it's hard to believe that he what he's doing reflects any type of a strategy, let alone a strategy that would win him votes. OK, well, this seems to be very similar to what happened in 2022. Uh, he couldn't get off the, the the election that was stolen from me in 2020. He stuck to his guns on that. And uh, those that predicted a red tsunami that would sweep the House of Representatives uh, didn't occur. And right. it was a direct, a direct result of Donald Trump's lack of strategy and his inability to move forward with policies and the future. Um, is he doing a replay of 2022? Sounds like it. And it also sounds like he just uh, he's laid the groundwork, you know, for the challenges within the states. And hopefully uh, the states have uh, p positions or statutes in place that can deal with those refusing to certify the election and will uh, cut off that route. But the other route is, I think he is laying the ground for another uh, January 6th. 
And he has said so himself. He said there will be blood, as I recall, on one occasion. So um, I I think he's just uh, doing the same thing that he did back even in 2020. He laid the groundwork for losing. He lost. And then he tried to put his uh, January 6 moves into play. Yeah, I guess the biggest difference is that He's wasn't he was in power as the president of the United States in 2020, and this time he's on the outside looking in. So um, that might be a little bit tougher for him to, um, you know, throw a monkey wrench into the election of 2024. You know, um, Hillary Clinton was criticized heavily in 2016, 2015, excuse me, that she failed to visit those states uh, frequently that was in the um, in the Rust Belt. Uh, Pennsylvania, Michigan. She thought by poll numbers, she had that all wrapped up. And of course, that's how Donald Trump won the, 20, the 2016 election. Uh, those same states are still in play. Uh, that is one major strategy of winning this election for either candidate. And it just seems to me that, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Kamala Harris is adhering to that strategy uh, frequency, you know, frequenting the, uh, and visiting Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan a lot. Uh, but now Donald Trump with this announcement that he's going to hit Democratic states like New York, California, Colorado. Do you see any wisdom in that? No, it, it seems like and I was just thinking of what you were saying, because if you look at the latest polls, which I don't believe in, but they show him ahead by two points in Arizona and one other state, I believe. So uh, he's, I don't know if he wants to rest on his laurels in those states and move on to others, but it seems like um, in turning to the other states, he is neglecting those where it is very even if he's not ahead. All righty, thank you. Uh, Jay, I'm going to go to the same question regarding um if Donald Trump's strategy, either planned or not planned, is a twofold strategy, which is to say, um, I want to motivate my base to make sure I get the highest percentage of voters out of their chairs and to the polls, yet at the same time, prepare those exact same voters uh, for my election loss and have them energized in case I would have put them the action uh, after election loss. Do you think there's any validity or any strategy in that? Yeah, I mean, he, he keeps saying that uh, it doesn't matter. The votes don't matter. He's avoiding mm, debates. He's avoiding the interview with uh, 60 Minutes last week. Um, he's doing the same kinds of things he was doing before. As, as Kamala Harris said, you know, he's not a serious candidate. He's being unserious. He's not really making a legitimate presidential campaign effort in so many ways. Um, and so you have to look at this, as, as Dave pointed out, uh, at, at two levels. You know, the first is what kind of campaign is he running? And it's not that good. He's lying. Uh, he's making ridiculous promises. Um, he is uh, repeating absurd conspiracies. Uh, any any rational person would be, you know, uh, unimpressed. Um, of course, you wonder about the base because they're not, generally speaking, they're not very rational. That's on one side of it. On the flip side, you know, with his hands behind his back, um, as they were in uh, 2020 and 2021, with his hands behind his back, he's he's fomenting unrest among the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers. He's calling stochastically for people to get out in the street and and do insurrection protests and the like. Um, he's going to do something else. He's not telling us what, but I think it's a fair assumption that he's going to do something else, something violent, something with guns and assault rifles and the like. You know, and, and generally speaking, Democrats don't walk around with assault rifles, um, but his Second Amendment GOP, they walk around with assault rifles. And you know, if you and I are faced with somebody with an assault rifle, what are we going to do exactly? And then the the threats, the threats, uh, you know, to the courts, the judges, the juries, the prosecutors, the threats, the threats to um, you know the election officials 
what troubles me most. These things are happening. We may not see them in the press. And frankly, that's something, Tim, I think we should discuss here today, is the press cognizant of this, this double standard, this double attack. Um, and if it isn't, um, are we? how much are we losing in the process here a few weeks before the election? So <clears throat> I worry a lot about Trump's um, hands behind his back, wink and blink, uh, mm -hmm. sending stochastic messages to a violent base. He's setting them up for more violence uh, as and when he loses. And he may very well lose um, because he's being such an idiot. And, you know, even if the, the hardcore base agrees with some of his machinations, uh, he, he's probably losing some voters when he talks about dogs and cats and weather and, you know, blaming everything on Biden. I mean, they got to be thinking twice about that. There are those who accept everything he says because he's a cult figure. But there are those on the on the margins who may say, wait a minute, this is just not so. Um, and and I think he's he's losing votes. He must know that, but he doesn't care. Well, you know, for seven years, Jay, you and I talked about his ability to be the great distractor, you know, the silver object, um, creating news headlines to basically uh, cover up that, that information which is coming out elsewhere or uh, trying to cover up a strategy of his. And I, I, I go back to your comment here about uh, the election process. And I, I'm worried, too, because... Uh, you know, one of the things the media is not covering very well or, or, or a lot is about these uh, poll watchers that are going to be dis, you know, dispatched in, in many of these southern states, uh, particularly in Georgia. Um, these poll watchers, to what degree will they intimidate voters that are standing in line? To what degree will they be carrying an AR-15 on their back because allow they're allowed to do so in open public? Um, we saw some of that in the 2022 election. Uh, people who are watching to make sure that quote unquote votes weren't being stolen. Uh, I, I, I share the same concern with you. And I guess the question is, is that what this is all about? Is that what his criticism about uh, the FEMA response to Hurricane uh, Helena or how the Democrats are behind his attempted assassinations? Is that the distraction? And then quietly uh, they're putting in place uh, a process of vote uh, vote cancellation. Oh, I, I think so. I think that's exactly what his strategy is. And that's the that's a core point of this discussion. Remember that uh, there were 60 lawsuits attacking the election um, in 2021, of, of which he lost nearly all of them, maybe 59 of them, something like that. Already now, we don't have an election yet. Already, we have no results yet. Uh, he's filed 120 lawsuits. That ha that's double. Um, so he's making an attack in the courts. He thinks he can get traction in the courts. I mean, it's this is um, you know, a hybrid kind of war. It's everything and anything, and we only know part of it. And my trouble with this is, why not? Why don't we know the rest of it? Why isn't the press having this very conversation that the three of us are having today? Um, we should all be aware of what he's doing behind his back, and we should all be dealing with it. And we should, you know, the lawyers, I'm afraid, should be out there fighting with those 120 lawsuits and making them public. Um, the, the people who care about the future of the country should be out there trying to give comfort to the election officials. And, and I don't see that happening. I see people are numb. They're neutralized. They're in fatigue over this election, which has gone on since 2017, really. Um, and and as a result, you know, they, they become wallflowers. They become, you know, uninvolved. And this is very troublesome because that's exactly what Trump is counting on. OK, thank you, Jay. Uh, David, to what degree do you think these these words and statements from Donald Trump, be it about in Butler, Pennsylvania, be it about Springfield, Ohio, or be about uh, the the response, the FEMA uh, federal government response to uh, Hurricane Helena. Do you do you agree or do you buy that those are mere distractions and the real the real deal going on is uh, obstruction of an election process in certain swing states? Uh, what do you what's your take on that? 
I would kind of agree with that. I think that the purpose of the, uh, you mentioned the uh, poll watchers, and they're there for uh, really one, two reasons. Why? One, to intimidate the voters, and two, to intimidate the vote counters. And so that's that's the real game. I think that uh, that they're doing. I think the outlet Jay's right. The outlandish statements they're losing votes. You know that's it's it's crazy for him to do that. But that may be part of the distraction that you're talking about, mm -hmm. where they just raise this. The other thing that is really troubling, and Jay touched on it, is the press and their. Uh, the false equivalencies that we're seeing where uh, they treat one action by Trump as is um, somewhat uh, equal to or less than the actions of others. It just uh, they they fail to distinguish the difference between the acts that they're comparing in a hope for balance, you know, some sort of classical balance out of. Mm -hmm. Uh, that movie with uh, Jimmy Cagney uh, or Superman um, and Perry White, you know, in the press, um, uh, out of a hope for balance. They're operating, the press is operating in some classical model uh, where they got to represent both sides. So I find it extraordinary. You, you've heard the term sane washing. Sane washing is the guy, Trump, makes outrageous statements. He is completely incoherent. He goes on for hours. His crowd walks out on him. But the press is reporting the one moment of sanity that they can find in his absurd remarks. And I find they're, they're, they're washing him to sane, sane washing. And, and why are they doing that? The real news is he's out of his mind. That's the real news. But they don't report that. Um, you know, uh, we have a concept on healthcare. It's a concept. We've been working on it for, what, you know, how many years now? Uh, eight years. Um, and we're working toward a concept. What? That's crazy. And and the press reports that as if that was a real point of policy. It's not a point of policy. It's a fake out. Well, and, is, and is it the really press or is it just Fox News? Come on. Um, I think most uh, legitimate press organizations have called out that, you know, Donald Trump did everything in his power to... Uh, abolish the Affordable Care Act. And I, I think that came through loud and clear uh, right after the debate and the days following the debate. Uh, you may be talking about Newsmax or, or Fox News. What do you think, Jay? Well, I, I think I think that uh, when he lies, when he makes ridiculous statements like that, when he punts on major policy points, you got to catch him right now. Somehow he cowed CBS right. into not right. fact-checking real time. What, what, why they get cowed that way? There should be real time. You know, we have AI. We can fact check them instantly, but they didn't do that. And then later you find this kind of scattergun approach to fact checking. And the people in the barbershop in Texas listening to Sinclair Radio, they don't know what you said on page 46 in fact checking. Mm. They don't know what you said on page one. Um, so, you know, it's it's lost. It's actually lost. The other thing is they take these these uh, pot shots, a lot of them, and I'm sad about this. Legitimate journalists in what have been legitimate publications take pot shots at Kamala Harris. She's not telling us enough about her position. Well, how about Trump's position? He hasn't got a position. You know, and you make this absurd comparison. She's not giving us dollars and cents. She's not telling us exactly what she expects Congress to do, even if Congress did something. Um, and so my, my concern is that the press treats this in this sort of strange, balanced way, uh, where somehow she comes out at the bottom end and they criticize her because she's not giving you enough detail. Really? She's giving plenty. Of, and even after she gives you all kinds of detail, they still say it. They repeat it. Why are they doing that? They're doing that. We talked well, about this before, Tim. We talked about it last they, week. We talked about it last yeah. week, right down to the finish, the last day of the election. They want it nose to nose, neck to neck, and they want a horse race. So uh, let's report, not report on that, which is not going to give anyone an unfair advantage till election day. Closeness sells papers. <laughs> Bingo. And papers sell advertisement. Advertisement means profits. Exactly. David, it's not just Donald Trump. 
<clears throat> coming up with these outlandish things. I mean, clearly, it looks like he's abandoning the independent vote. It, it appears that he's abandoning Republicans who are the old time moderates. Uh, it, it looks like he's going strictly for the red meat and he's going strictly for the MAGA base at this point. And I don't understand why, but he's, it looks that way, at least. We know that no matter what, his highest ratings has been 46, 47 percent on, on his extreme statements. He never rises above 47 percent. Uh, how do you win an election at 47 percent? This is what I don't understand. The strategy is, yeah, he may get more people to uh, come out, out of their chairs and vote, but it won't get him much more than 47, 48 percent. How, how does he expect to win? Or does he? Does he expect to win? Uh, well, as as in the uh, election, I guess 2016, he didn't expect to win, right? And he started preparing people for the fact that he might lose, as he did in 2020. Uh, so, you know, it's more of the same, I think. I think that he... Uh, he he's not he's got to realize that making those crazy statements he's driving people even those on the border uh, away and it doesn't seem to make any difference to him so as you are well, implying there's got to be something else behind this and uh, it could the the only thing that you can see that's evident is the uh, tampering with the uh, voting mechanism and uh, just violence after. All right. Do you think he has any influence over his surrogates? And I'm thinking specifically of Marjorie Taylor Greene and her outlandish comments, uh, statements, proclamations, whatever you want to call them, that the United States government has the ability to control the weather. And therefore, that's exactly what <laughs> happened with Hurricane uh, Helena. Um, as Jay used to say, and I, I say it still today, que pasa? It it uh, the outlandish statements and st how do you control a crazy? I think is the re is the real question. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene and others, including Trump, and I don't know. Uh, you know, I think it's a, 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 a something that's not worth the effort. This morning, I don't know if you watched it or not. Uh, President Biden had to go on national TV to call out Marjorie Taylor Greene to say. He didn't say it in so many words, but the the he implied that she's batshit crazy. Um, mm -hmm. So they did have to take the effort. And I, I think we're at a point in this campaign where we have three weeks left. And on how much more outlandish does it get? Uh, any predictions on that, David? No, uh, but I think that Jay is right when he says you have to, in order to control things like that, as, as Biden apparently stepped out this morning, you have to uh, counter it right at the time, Moment. at the spot. You can't let it sit because, as Jay said, if you let it sit, it comes back in scatter fire and it doesn't register. Good point. Yeah, never leave a room when they've left the wrong impression about you. That's correct. Um, <laughs> you know, Always in a campaign, and I remember uh, 2020, um, 30 days before the election, Bob Woodward came out with a book that basically said that in their taped interviews, Donald Trump knew full well that COVID was far more deadly in February of 2020 than what he told the American public in March of 2020. In March of 2020, and Jay, you may remember, you and I did a, a show on, on how Donald Trump was calling COVID a, a democratic hoax. Yet Bob, Wood, Bob Woodward's book in February of 2020, he said within his own voice that they knew it was far more deadly. It was going to kill a lot of Americans. And I think that had an impact really on the election. So here we are, fast forward to 2024, and Bob Woodward yet again in October comes out with a book saying, um, oh, Vlad, Vladimir Putin and, and Donald Trump seems to be best of buds. And that... Uh, there's been no less than seven conversations unknown to the State Department or anyone in the in the White House, and certainly the uh, the generous gift of of COVID uh, testing kits to old Vlad, his buddy. I know there's always the unexpected before an election. Do you feel that this particular story uh, from Bob Woodward is going to have any impact on the Trump strategy, uh, or will they just ignore it, or will they try to address it with another uh, major distraction? some outlandish distraction. David. I think the latter. 
they they will try to just uh, create something else to draw attention away from it. Uh, I that's what I think. Okay, Jay, your thoughts on that particular story that just broke? It's a horrendous story. We, if you recall, we were desperate for uh, COVID testing. There weren't enough COVID tests in the country. People were dying, and he's giving them away to uh, to his friend Vlad with whom he has had at least half a dozen, maybe more, telephone conversations in violation of the the Logan Act, um, trying to fashion policy in relation, foreign relations with Russia right now. Comes out in the paper. Do you think the guys in the barbershop uh, listening to Sinclair Radio know about that or care about that? But let me let me say, though, it's not just Sinclair Radio. Um, which is of great concern to me, that are pumping out um, pro, pro-Trump pro statements all day long to millions of people. If you want to try to understand why, you know, the, the, the base is so big, it's because media like that are corrupting their thought process. But it's more than that. It's social media. It's Elon Musk, who has some 2 billion people on his mailing list. Um, and it's Russia trying to affect social media in this country with phony baloney actors acting like Americans um, and and running down Harris and pumping up Trump is happening all the time. And I don't understand why we don't hear more about it. This is a great concern that there are there are countries and uh, autocrats out there that would love to see the U.S. fail. And Trump is really a statement of the failure of the U.S., as one um, journalist in, uh, in in Ireland said, I pity the United States. We should pity ourselves if we can't have an, you know an election that is re- responsible. Um, and don't forget China. China doing the same thing. It's it's trying to affect public opinion and the electorate in this country using sophisticated social media and AI. Right now, today. And I don't understand why CNBC doesn't really cover that. The intelligence agencies are telling telling us that in no uncertain terms. And yet we have all this kind of entertainment, um, you know, these reality show type jokes and whatnot. We have a we have a whole bunch of late night comedians, talk show hosts who are making fun. But the reality isn't there. We're not dealing with it. Trump knows how to deal with the press. You got to give him credit for that. Yeah, you do. I think it's um, it's really tragic. As we have discussed, Tim, um, the media collectively, it's a kingmaker. And they're and they're in large part making Trump a king. And you know, at the end of the day, what did you what did you do in the election of 2024, Daddy? Mm-hmm. Now, who did you listen to? Who did you vote for? Because if Trump wins, you know, we're done. Yeah. You know, when you mentioned your concern about Sinclair stations, uh, I'll take you down memory lane. Uh, maybe it was 2018, uh, where Sinclair news stations all had the exact word for word um, report to read that was in support of Trump. And uh, they they caught hell for it because they are all given a directive. Now, some of the news, the, the um, some of the news station organizations uh, that were owned by Sinclair um, they refused to read it, and they lost their jobs. They quit, or they were fired for not uh, following the management direction. So, um, yeah, we have a coordinated effort from uh, certain news organizations to basically undermine what, what I would call fair and balanced reporting. But there it is. So um, we've run out of time, and I'm going to go to you, David, for your last thoughts on this topic. Uh, well, I just would uh, re- well, there's one other thing that I could think of, and uh, you mentioned Musk, and uh, one of the things that is really concerning about his money is he's employing it to hire people to go door to door in the border states, the ones that are close to the line. And that's wor- that is very worrisome. Also, it's something that has to be countered. But I think the last word would be that um, I think uh, stop the false equivalency, uh, confront every time a mistake, a, a incorrect lie is is stated, and I think those are the ways to combat Trump. 
And I think if we do that, I think that uh, Kamala will be in good stead. All right, David, thank you so much for your thoughts. Uh, Jay, you get the last word here today. I want to talk about uh, the scenario A and scenario B. Um, scenario A um, is, you know, the press reports what he has to say. For some reason, everything he says is newsworthy, even if he's standing there alone in a press conference where nobody is permitted to ask him questions. What kind of a press conference is that? Just, you know, makes a rambling speech. Anyway, that's that's scenario A. Scenario B is of much greater concern. It's that, you know, he intimidates the press. He will not recognize questions from journalists that don't please him. Um, he calls them names like enemies of the people. Um, he is trying to undermine their credibility. He's been trying to do that uh, from his manipulative point of view uh, from the you know from the time he was practicing real estate. But but the point though is, and we have talked about this also, and it's worth mentioning, and I want to mention it, is that the press um, is thinking of its future. And they are they are not going to come down hard on him because they know that if he wins, uh, he will exorcise them from the news process. They won't be permitted to come into the press room. Uh, they won't get the press releases. Um, none of his administration will, all of which will be completely acolyte next time. Um, his administration won't talk to them. So if you're a profit-oriented journalistic organization, that gives you a lot of fear. Fear that he would change the New York Times rule about you know exemption for public figures and all, um, and um, Section 230 of the Federal Communications Act. I mean, these issues are would be in play with him, and he would try to, uh, you know, chop the press off at their ankles one way or the other. So they say to themselves, gee, we have a duty to our stockholders and our directors. Uh, we can't let him do that to us. So what we're going to do is we're going to go soft on him. And I think if you watch carefully with this, quote, balanced approach that you see, um, that's what you see. You see they're not going to knock him hard because they they want to retain some kind of access to the news under a new Trump administration. And that doesn't give us the full story in terms of their reporting right now. All right. You know, I'm going to, before I conclude, I'm going to pick up on something you said. And, uh, you know, when your, your grandchildren look you in the eye or your son or daughter looks you in the eye and say, what did you do during the great election of 2024, grandfather? Uh, have an answer for them. Have an answer that, yeah, I got up and I voted against an autocrat. I got up and sent money to defeat an autocrat. I did what I did. I took a stand. I took a position to defeat uh, a mentally ill narcissist who wanted to become president again of the United States. So I have an answer for him. And with that, I'd like to thank my special esteemed guest, David Hall, and of course, always my co-host, Jay Fidel. This is American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apatel, your host. And until next week, aloha. Mm -hmm.